initially when we started this project, Mike, you know, we just only wanted to focus on McPhee. And we thought it would be kind of a disservice because the signing, I think the Shane Ray signing happened the morning of or something like that when you and I were talking about this, if not the day before. And then all of a sudden it became, you know what, Shane Ray's kind of similar. I don't think the effectiveness is there. Like the feet where it's kind of like hidden in layers where we can point to what you need to but, but uh, you know, when you dig when you dig out of this a bit, um, you see that you can kind of take the same approach because his numbers just aren't there and he's been injured the last two seasons. So I think, um, you know, what we're going to do now is talk about Shane Ray, but by going through the tape, I think it far, further illustrates uh, what he can do. I think they're very, like, as, as opposed to McPhee, who I think um, is a guy that can wear a couple of different hats he can line up in different uh, variety of ways. Shane Ray, to this point, has been labeled kind of more of a one-trick pony and is known as an edge rusher all the way, although I think you're going to kind of dispel a little bit of that in the tape. But to this point, he's kind of been labeled as a one-dimensional guy. If you look back at 2016, it's pretty telling that Pro Football Focus called him one of the 10 most improved players. I'm like, all He was one of their top 10 guys. They thought of him. And I think some of the other numbers that stand out is in four seasons with Denver, you know, ended up with a 12.6 percent pass rush win rate. Um, just for the to help clarify what win rate exa- exactly means, it just means one on one he's able to win his matchup. So that's that's value because that means that if you put him in that scenario, he, he may not get a, a, a you know he might not give he may he may not get that gift pass rush as much as he's winning those pass rushes and going up against the guy that he's facing whether it's through speed or, or through a move or through power he's he's able to win um, so that's a pretty good win rate um, and so I think that those are a couple of the notes that I had on Shane Ray just kind of looking at him um, at a glance and I think he is a guy that jumps off the page in terms of his physical talent always has to look at going back to his college days and you and I talked before we jumped on this there's something to the fact the Ravens also like to bring in guys that have done well against them <laughs> or when they've looked at the tape, you know, it's kind of stood out. And I think he's another one of these guys, right? Um, any other thoughts on that? Like, I mean, you, you were kind of hitting on that point before. Yeah, no, we, we do have a couple of clips from the, the week three game against uh, the uh, Ravens against Denver from, from last season. But no, I, I, I agree. I definitely think that they've shown that, um, when guys play them and play well, um, you know, they, they show some interest in that. And then, um, you know, if you go back and you, and you look at his statistics from that game, you may say, well, I don't see anything huge. I mean, he did have a sack and a forced fumble in that game. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty huge to me. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, the, yeah. Ravens, Ravens, the Ravens were actually able to recover it, but I mean, I, I still think, you know, that's a pretty impactful play, but um I think it's that. I think that they they pay attention to guys who play well against them, and and you know they gain some respect that way. And then I think that you mentioned even going back to 2015, the year that he came out in the draft, he was probably a guy that they had scouted and and had taken a look mm-hmm. at. I, I don't remember exactly where they were drafting that year, but um, you know he he probably was a guy that they had taken a look at. And um, you know he's an edge rusher, right? He's 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 probably best suited to to be an edge rusher in a in a three four style right. defense, and so. That's that's their that's their their wheelhouse, right? I mean, that, those are the kinds of guys that they look for. So, it all sort of fits together. And I think a big part of the story for him uh, this year with this opportunity is how healthy is he? Again, like you said, mm-hmm. going going back to health because he's had you know the wrist issue, uh, maybe some other issues too. But I know the wrist one is kind of the more prominent one. And and based on that, which Shane Ray are you getting? Are you getting the rookie year 2015 pre-injury Shane Ray, who I think had four solo sacks, and I think he might have combined for maybe another three or four. So he had like eight total or something like that. Um, And, you know, had a bunch of pressures and a bunch of QB hits and, you know, made some plays in the run game. Or are you getting the guy who's kind of battled through injuries the last couple of years and maybe hasn't been quite as effective and uh, is still trying to, you know, find his way back to sort of that level that he was starting to set? as a rookie. So that that's what I think you're going to kind of see unfold over OTAs and training camps. Which, which guy is he at this point? 
Yeah, I, and we talked about this a bit before the call. You know, that wrist injury is tremendous. You're going to go through how it affects the physical, like the physics of a pass rush, right? We don't think about it, but it's, it's a huge impact in terms of being able to lift a guy, being able to jolt a guy, being able to use force in that area. And if you don't, and we, I've had minor, minor, minor wrist issues, and I'm just, you know, typing on a computer a lot of the time in my day to day. So it's yeah. like, and it throbs and it's just the worst. So, I mean, to think about, you know, hitting a 310, 315, 320 pound tackle, um, and I'm being conservative. I mean, there's guys that are, you know, way heavier than that. But the point is, is that, yeah, I mean, we, that uh, no doubt has probably affected him in some ways. And I think um, going back to your question about, or just kind of, out of, you know, wondering where he went in that 2015 draft, um, you know, he was the 23rd pick. So he went before the Ravens selection at 26 with, okay. uh, they went with Perryman, but I'm of the belief of just thinking back at that stage, he was very much in play. Uh, he wasn't available. I, I mean, they ended up, the Broncos ended up getting him a, a couple picks before, but like, I think, you know, I don't have any exact proof, but I think they, they, they must have liked them as, you know, and I think the Ravens are, they tend to go back to their tape when they've scouted guys in the past. So I think there's something to that. Uh, so now I think this is a good spot for us to transition to those clips and, and kind of just talk through uh, what you've seen on tape with Shane and if you want to take it away. Okay. So let's start with that. Uh week three game against the Ravens and this first play um, this is pretty early in the first quarter and this is something that I wanted to start with because you see the Broncos do this with him um, you know throughout the snaps that he gets you see it a little bit more on third down I think this is the first down play but you'll see him you know inside right he's off the ball he doesn't have his hand down and so he's not you know on the ball or directly over the guard but he's lined up inside and off the ball they've got Von Miller uh, coming off the right side Bradley Chubb coming off the left side and um you're going to see them use uh, a, a twist game with Ray and Chubb on that left side. So on this particular play, uh, you're going to see Ray um, show some of that mobility, right? So he takes a couple steps to sort of attack um, the left guard, sort of that outside shoulder, like he's kind of going to rush him outside. But then, you know, he sort of uh, adjusts his angle and tries to pick the inside shoulder of Ronnie Stanley, right, the left tackle, and then that allows Chubb to try to loop around. Now, now Chubb got chipped uh, by the slot on the way out, so that's sort of slowed his ability to come down and really attack the left guard. But uh, you can see how Ray follows through, right? So even after he sets that pick, a lot of times people disregard that picker. They're like, oh, this whole play was designed for the looper to get the pressure, right? But he continues, you know, and converts into a bull rush and tries to drive Stanley back. And then this is really, really subtle. But at the very end of that play, before Flacco gets the ball out, you can see him sort of, you know, pushing Stanley back a step or two. And, and Stanley's kind of starting to drop his anchor. But then Stanley kind of gets his weight on that outside foot, that back foot. And Ray is able to just slightly come underneath him. And at the very last minute, try to get his hand up. But Flacco just got the ball out a split second before. So, that's a very nuanced thing, but the fact that he was able to take advantage of sort of that weight being shifted to Ronnie's outside foot and say, hey, I'm pretty much stymied here, but can I come back inside? To me, that just shows a guy effort, right? He's not going to give right. up in the rush. He's going to keep working. He's going to try to find a way to get there, even if maybe his first move or, or you know, counter move is shut down. Now, the ultimate result of this play is an incompletion. You know, Flacco just barely gets that ball out of bounds to John Brown, but this I wanted to show this play because it was more about them using him in this twist game because I think mm -hmm. that's really where you could see him used a lot because he is such a mobile and such an athletic guy that you really want to use that and maximize that movement ability. Yeah, and I agree with you. Uh, that was something that we talked about at length about McPhee, his ability to line up and run some games and you know help with the tackle end stunt in particular. But I think the ver there's some versatility that that um, Ray brings to the table that I, I don't think is necessarily thought of immediately because he is someone that is such a dynamic edge rusher and a speed rusher at that so if you I mean just looking at the technique like you said he understands how to uh, work 
the inside as well and just be in a different uh, position, uh, that's a big, I think, value for the for the pass rush. And, and, a, and I think especially because it, it just gives you that much more ability to disguise if you're a wink. So, so now all of a sudden, you know, can Ray be in a position that the offensive line's not anticipating? I mean, that's something that they can work with. So um, I think you're right. And, you know, the... The, the, I wanted to talk. I wanted to hit on something you said: his aggressiveness, his relentlessness. I mean, that's something that he's known for. Uh, if nothing else, the guy is not going to take a playoff. Like he plays with his hair on fire. That that old expression. So, I think that effort and that aggressiveness. Once he's on the field, he's feeling good about himself. He's healthy. He, he's he's a guy that everybody has said is he plays off of emotion, and he's not. He's a guy that gets fueled based on momentum, emotion, all that. So, if you're if you're able to manage the snaps, um, I think you're going to see some of that contained a little bit better, hopefully. And we'll see that if he's healthy, you know, he's going to be able to let it all out. But you're going to get to that as well. Yeah, and I think uh, I've got another play here from that Ravens game, and I'm I'm not sure if we talked about this one or not, but I'm I'm going to sneak it in here now because this this uh, one. Okay, bring it up. Yeah, Ravens clips are always good. This this was the the sack and the forced fumble. Uh, um, again, he sort of lined up in that inside off the ball position again, um, almost in a four eye, almost on the inside shoulder of the tackle, almost or, or like a super wide three. Um, and he's working this time one on one. So now there's no game. This is just him one on one against Alex Lewis, and he gives him the little shimmy shake move right to try to get Alex to stop his feet or or sort of guess wrong. And then he goes with a club of his own, right? Pretty, pretty good, good club there to, to Alex's outside arm. But his pad level's a little high, right? You look at him in relation to where Alex is. He's kind of exposed his chest a little bit. And you see that in the next sort of split second of the clip. Alex gets that outside hand kind of up, that arm bar. Some people call it a wrench kind of move, right, mm-hmm. on Ray. Uh, because I think his pad level was a little bit higher than you'd like to see it there. But then... He keeps, here's that effort again, right? He goes to the rip and he just keeps working. He keeps working that yeah. outside arm, keeps working around that outside edge. Alex is, is, you know, they're both really, you know, struggling and stressing and straining. And eventually Rain is a- Ray is able to get free, right? Beat him around that outside edge, hit Flacco and knock the ball out. And, right. you know, right. Shaq Barrett tries to pick it up on the run instead of diving on it and he misses. And Alex Lewis fortunately gets it back, fortunately, if you're a Ravens fan. Uh, and so it didn't result in a turnover. But again, to your point about that effort and that determination, even though that initial move didn't hit as quickly as maybe he probably would have liked it to, he didn't stop working, right? He kept working, he kept working, he ends up forcing a forcing a fumble. Yeah, it's important, though, to stress that because effort rush is also, you know, eventually it's going to pay off, especially when you have coverage. In this case, the coverage and the rush complemented each other. Uh, and we're going to see that this season. I mean, you're going to see scenarios where uh, the coverage is going to be pretty tight. You know, Flacco had to hold the ball a little bit longer. Uh, it's pretty clear in the All-22 that, you know, that there just wasn't anywhere for him to go. And I think this is uh, – I think that you made another excellent point here in terms of, you know, with, with Ray kind of making sure that he still mentioned Alex Lewis as a turn – Normally, you might see guards being able to kind of shove the guy all the way. Not all the way, but shove him enough, right? It's almost like I'm trying to think back to the the Allen play that you illustrated before, um, that Allen-McPhee exchange. But there's a different dance that happens the other way, right, with the offensive lineman. They're able to have enough of a subtle move to get the rusher off. But that didn't work. So that kind of also stands out too on this clip is that, um, you know, you saw Ray really do a nice job of, he already knows he has, he has Alex Lewis um, off of his stance and like in a pretty bad, you know, in a pretty bad position. So he just keeps at it. He could have easily given up to mm-hmm. your point, but he kept at it. Yeah. You see, you see guys sometimes get to that point and then just get washed behind the pocket. That's you what know, I was they, trying to think of is the wash. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they just exactly they just never can get around that corner. They they try and they I'm not gonna say they yeah. give up, but they just they just kinda, you know, like, hey, he stopped me and uh, you know, I, I, I don't think I can get back in this play. But he just doesn't play with that mentality. It almost seems like he thinks that he can, you know, make a play or finish the play no matter how it initially starts. So you see his mindset is just an attacking mindset. I'm gonna keep attacking, I'm gonna keep attacking. No, absolutely. And I think that's gonna be complimentary 
to the rest of the guys as well. It's going to rub off. Yep, for sure. Now, those were two plays from last season. But in light of the wrist injury that we talked about, I wanted to go back and look at some plays from his rookie season before he had the wrist injury to sort of see what kind of player he looked like back then compared to, you know, sort of where he's at now and his recovery from the injury. So a couple of games here. Uh, I wanted to start with, uh, I think it was a week four game back in 2015 against the Vikings. Tells you how long ago this was. Teddy Bridgewater was a quarterback for the Vikings back then. Oh, boy. Yeah, those were the days, huh? Yeah, a lot has changed for for Teddy back then, but he's in New Orleans, I think, still. Um, Air apparent to Drew Brees at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you could be in a worse spot, right? Um, So on this play, uh, Ray is on the offense's right-hand side, so he's rushing over the right tackle, almost in a three-point stance. He's kind of got that hand down a little bit, so, I mean, you could could say he's there. Um, What I like about this is, again, it shows his mobility, right? So he's going to sort of start with that one plant outside, cross the right tackle's face, and then just drive through that one arm, you know, that the right tackle, his, his inside arm that he tries to stick out and kind of, you know, hold Ray. And you see the club, you see the rip, and then just the power to drive through that, right? That's mm-hmm. something that I think has been a little bit different um, since the wrist injury. You, you maybe don't always see that power as consistently as you're going to see on some of these plays where, you know, maybe if that happened – um, after the wrist injury, I think he's, you know, a little bit further in his recovery now, but like right after that injury, it might've been hard for him to drive through that. Uh, and it probably really would have been hard for him to use that, uh, that club rip, uh, on that inside arm. But, you know, he was able to do it here cause it was pre-injury and he gets the sack. Yeah, exactly. So he's able to use his hands, t- uh, totally without any hesitation, without any limitation, and you see, which is interesting because if you just look at this play, like it really illustrates, I, I think, the the deceptive power he has. Because I think, you know, this was his rookie year, right? So coming out of college, there was a rep. He had a little bit of a rep that he didn't play with as much power. But I think this is a nice illustration of when he can play with power. And uh, it's a nice, I think, and also like to your point, he he's almost in a three point stance, so it's a slant. And you slant through, and he's able to just knife himself through the line. So it's a good, it's it's a good thing to see if he's recovered, like you said, with his hand, with his wrist, uh, the ability to use him in this kind of role. Where you know, if you're looking at the offense, if you're looking at this from the offense's perspective, you can't fully tell at the snap, right? Like if he's going to drop, if he's going to, again, getting back to the disguise element, like what is yep. he going to do? I mean, he's kind of in a uh, a little bit of an in-between position where he could be a guy that could drop into a zone coverage. So I think I, I like that too here because in my mind, and I, you can tell me if I'm wrong before you cut up some of the tape, like in my mind, I thought he was just exclusively, again, getting back to that one dimension. Like I thought he just kind of lined up either in a two, primarily in a two point, but just kind of outside without giving any disguise element. But that's not the case. It looks like this is something the Ravens can u- really utilize as well. Yeah, I think he's definitely got some versatility that way. He he definitely had uh, some snaps where he did drop into coverage. So you might have seen an alignment like that, right, where you see here where he's at. And then you see he's got, um, I don't know if that's a safety or a nickel or a linebacker next to him over the tight end, number 82. But mm-hmm. you just don't know if maybe Ray is going to drop out and that other defender next to him is going to rush. You know, right, you know, and they yeah, both end up coming on this play. Yeah. And you, the back is having to, and because the line didn't, the line, you know, if, if you just look at this play, it's beautiful because the slant is there, the line doesn't really shift, I mean, they shift down a bit, and then the back has to come over, and that's TJ Ward, I believe, who's one of the best blitzing DBs in football in that, in that year especially. So if you can imagine a scenario where, guess what, T- Tony Jefferson's that guy, or... Yeah. Anthony, Anthony Levine is that guy, whoever, right? And that's the type of thing you can do. And then we talked about that with the McPhee clips, too. Like, that's the type of uh, formation manipulation that, that Wink can do uh, just with that little subtlety of a, a different stance. Yeah, and you got the two-for-one on this play because you, you made a good point about sort of the overall structure of this rush. He slants inside, right? to draw that tackle inside to free up an outside yep. rushing lane for that DB. Now the back comes over, right? But Ray is actually able to beat the tackle and get the sack. 
where, you know, let's say he wasn't able to do that, but yet he still executes his job and he pulls that guy yep. inside, but now you got a safety on the back and you probably like that matchup. So yeah. he actually gives you the two for one here. Yep. He does his job and he makes the play. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's the type of thing that I've seen so many times when you analyze the blitzes that the Ravens have run and they don't get home sometimes. But the point is that they're always going to get home. It's not always going to be successful, but it, you know you have to create some mismatch opportunities, and that's what they do in, on this play here. But yeah. uh, I'm going to let you continue with this because this is pretty fun. Uh, let's, okay. let's see what happens on the next one. So next play, this is a good illustration of that power that we talked about and sort of what he was able to do pre-wrist injury. And one thing he mentioned, I think, you know, he spoke uh, at one of the first OTAs uh, recently here with the Ravens, and he talked about how people don't even think about, it's not just the effect of that injury on the field, it's off the field. Because he said there were certain lifts, there were certain things he wasn't able to do in the weight room because of that wrist injury. So now that impacts your play strength, right? You're not able to sort of work out and build that strength in certain parts of your body because your wrist won't allow you to. Um, but when you look at this play, so this is against the Raiders. Uh, this is against Donald Penn, another really good left tackle in the league, um, particularly back then, 2015. And yep. Ray's, com- Ray's coming off that left side. And this is, you know, bull rush, right? He gives him the little shimmy again, but then he converts just into a bull. He gets that inside hand kind of in the chest. Um, then he refits his outside hand. That's another sort of nuanced thing that I like. He had that outside hand sort of around Penn's back or around his shoulder, but then he refits it inside. And now you love that position, right, where the elbows are in tight. You can't even see his left elbow, right? It's in so tight. And 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 so now he's he's got that good inside position. He's got his hips lower than Penn's. And then he just starts to drive him back into car, right? And then I also love the hand placement as he finishes this. He, he gets his hands basically on Penn's wrist or sort of the forearm area, sort of forks lift, fork lifts them up in the air, right? Now, there's some other traffic going on back there, and it's really kind of hard to see. And I think Penn actually trips over somebody else's leg back there. But again, take advantage of that. If he's off balance, then just continue to knock him even further <laughs> off balance, right? Right. And they, they were in come, come underneath him and, uh, you know, sat car. So that power, even before, you know, that the issue with Penn maybe tripping over somebody else's leg, the power to drive him back. The reason he tripped is because he was driven back into the crowd. Um, so right. that's some power that uh, you didn't necessarily see as I watched some of the 2018 clips, not as consistently, but when you go back to 2015, and I know we're just talking about a handful of clips there, but you can see this show up pretty consistently. Good job with leverage, good job with power, good job with hand placement. And he was doing this as a rookie. Yeah, and you, no, I mean, there is there is some trash behind the pen that clearly could have caused him to lose his footing, but even still, it's pretty impressive that he's kind of forklifting him and getting him off of his feet. Penn is one of those 360-pounders <laughs> that we talked about earlier. Like, he is dude. not a 310, 315 Tyron Smith type of guy. I mean, he's a big dude, like you said. So being able to move that mass, I don't care like how it happened. It, it's, it's impressive regardless. So, uh, And this is what you hope for. I mean, he's supposedly he's come out and he said he's healthy. Uh, everybody's healthy at this point in the year. We'll find out, you know, what happens when those pads are on. But I think the big thing here, again, is if he's got the strength back, he's got the flexibility back, uh, I, I, don't, I think he's able to cut loose. All that's there. And, and you just have to hope that that's there because that's a big component of his game is explosion and use of his hands, use, use of his power. Um, which again is deceptive. I don't think it's something that, to me, it's not something that you first think of initially with him, but it's clearly there on tape. Yeah, and that 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 point that you just made about you know you hope that you're getting that same guy back you know after he's had you know more time to recover from that wrist injury. This is almost like a Patriots move, right? Where you take a former first round pick. Maybe he's had some injuries. Right. Maybe he's had some scheme fit issues and just didn't work out at other stops. And you bring him in. Now he's healthy. You have a very defined role in your system for what you want him to do because you've scouted him and you said, look, we can see what his strength is and we're going to only ask him to do what he's strong at. (laughs) And that's what they do. You know, that's how they get most out of these guys. And so if the Ravens are able to sort of use him in that way to say, look, you know, is playing the run a strength of his? Probably not. It doesn't mean he can't do it, but it's probably like it's not a strength. It's like. 
I tell people all the time, I'm right-handed, right? Can I write with my left-handed? Yeah, but it's not my strength. <laughs> you know, it exactly. doesn't, doesn't, yeah, so it doesn't mean I can't do it. It's just not a strength. So he can play the run. But if they can, you know, get him, they can do this 2015 version of Shane Ray, a healthy Shane Ray, and then all of that first-round ability, man, you, you, you could have something here if it's a big if. But if you can if you can get that, um, that that could be a really nice pickup. Um, so uh, I know I went kind of long there, so I'm going to go quick on this last play. This is against the Chargers. Um, now, this is a rookie free agent at right tackle right here. And I apologize for not jotting down his name. I probably should have known it. Um, so, you know, you do have to factor in, you know, who he's going against here. But again, you see another display of that power. Right. So this is just a one on one rush. Again, you know, I think initially it looked like the right tackle was in pretty good position and he's got his hands inside and that looks, you know, like a a pretty good starting position for him. But then again, Ray gets his hands right around that forearm wrist area. And again, there's that forklift, right? It's almost like like a chicken wing, like spreading apart a chicken wing almost, right? As he gets the as he gets the guy's arms to kind of go up and spread apart. And then once he gets your arms wide, uh, he refits his hands inside. And you can see this is another one, a subtle thing. If you look at that outside hand uh, on the tip, the outside tip of the uh, tackle shoulder, he's now twisting him, right? He's now pushing him in to sort of turn his shoulders because as a rusher, that's really what you want to do. If you can get the if you can get the tackle or the blocker's shoulders turned, you're going to create a soft edge, either outside or inside, right? They want to stay square. You want to turn them. So he turns them there, and now he's able to come inside. Right. And clean up on rivers at the end there. So um, right, right. you can you can talk about level of competition and, and that definitely is a factor. But again, the technique, um, the power, the determination, you know, to finish rivers is also a big dude. People don't necessarily mm-hmm. recognize that rivers is a big quarterback and it's not uh, not easy to get those dudes down. Obviously, Ravens fans know that about Big Ben. It's not easy to get those guys on the ground. So um, I, I, I like everything about what I saw from the 2015 snaps that I watched. And I really hope they can get that guy. Yeah. And I think the power of the explosion just kind of jumps off on this play. Like everything that, you know, in terms of his get off in terms of just having, and again, this isn't to take away from his ability, I think to make some, you know, make some moves and, and kind of just, you know, with those hesitation moves to maybe like set guys up and then, peel back inside and like have some some actual pass rush moves that's not to say he doesn't have that but i don't know that that's his strong suit necessarily i think that's part of we'll find out like if he's able to refine some of his game maybe the time off helped him maybe he picked up some other things from von miller watching him from the sidelines like so but this is him in a nutshell this is what you want him to do getting back to what you said let him rush the passer because that's really his forte uh, i had in my notes you know bruce Irvin. Yep. This guy that just rushes the passer. Don't overcomplicate it. And I think that's something that we've seen, you know, and I'm not, we'll find out this year, right? Like back to Eric DaCosta, the way he's approached building this pass rush is, you know, maybe this is the specialist type of approach, like you said with New England. Maybe we'll just let these guys do what they do best. And I think that has got a lot more potential than to take someone like a Shane Ray, play him on first, play him on second down, and then you're you're just disappointed because somebody runs right at him and he he loses contain or yep. he totally blows his assignment because he's trying to blow the play up uh behind the behind the uh, line of scrimmage right so like, as much as possible i think treat him like a rooster uh as a, until he should, i mean i made the analogy he's to me he's going to be kind of like a utility guy like it, it just keep like just milk his strength for all that you can and obviously, you also have to limit his snaps because he's he's shown that he can't stay healthy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, to that to that point. I so mean, that, I, that's I, the common denominator for the key. Uh, yeah. No, I I was just gonna say to that to that point. I mean, I I really like that model. Uh, New England's not the only team that has done it. I mean, they get the most sort of publicity for it. But I like that model of you look at. Um, a role, right? You look at a position and the different roles that that position has to has to feel. So if you look at outside linebacker, 
Obviously, you want a guy who can rush the passer, but you're going to need a guy who can also play the run. Sometimes you're going to need a guy who's going to have to cover a tight end, you know, to that side based on formation. Or maybe they're going to go with 12 personnel and two tight ends. So they're going to have one on both sides of the field. So maybe, you know, he has to cover that guy in that particular situation. So you need guys at that position who can fill different roles. And the guys who can do it all, they're unicorns, right? These, these guys are rare. A guy who can right. fill all three or four of those roles, those right. guys just don't fall out of the sky. And so I think what the Patriots and some of the other teams have done is said, well, look, not only can we get the benefit of sort of the specialist, the guy who's the better pass rusher, the guy who's the better run defender, the guy who's the better coverage guy. And, you know, you're not always able to sort of guess when you're going to need them in that role. But, you know, through your your scouting and your game planning, you have a pretty good plan going into a game about when and what situation you're going to want guys to be on the field to maximize what they do best. It's not always going to be perfect, but, you know, you have a you have a plan that you go into the game with. And, you know, it also helps you, you know, from a financial standpoint. Again, exactly. Unicorns are rare because of ability, but they also get paid rarely. So, <laughs> you know, they make the kind of Absolutely. money that you don't see a lot of people make. And it's hard to build, uh, you know, a, a complete roster when you have to pour so much money into that unicorn. As great as he is, like Khalil Mack, right? And you see what happened with Oakland and people are, how could they, you know, trade him and how could they do that? And people are, you know, sort of calling that a bad move or a dumb move. I'm not going to pass judgment on it. Who knows? Time will tell. But, um, you know, that guy was a unicorn. <laughs> and so Absolutely. It's, it's, it's hard, you know, to find those guys and then maybe even harder to keep those guys because of, you know, the financial uh, sort of incentive that they that they command. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with uh, uh, that. I mean, Khalil Mack is the ultimate example where you're going to have to commit assets. You're going to have to commit cap. You're going to have to commit raw dollars towards, you know, the, that's what it's going to take. But if you can't do that, now you've built your defense in a way in which you know you're going to be more aggressive with your pass rush. You're going to be more aggressive with your blitz scheme. Can these guys come in? Can they manage them on a snap count, uh, on a pitch count, if you will, going back to the baseball analogies? Can you get the most out of them? I think they can. It's up to them to be, I mean, the real variable here is health. We don't know with McPhee and Ray. They've both had those those issues. But I think you have two motivated guys, especially with Ray. I mean, what do you have to lose? If anything, you have you have nothing to lose here. And you hope, like you said, he reverts to 2015, 2016 form. And then all of a sudden, you might have a guy that could have about six to eight sacks in them, if not – you know, you just kind of tally up the pressures, you tally up the win percentage. So I think if they can capture that, they're going to be in very good shape. And uh, that's what you hope for at best case, that, I think, scenario with Shane Ray. Yep, for sure. For sure. I I, I like it. I mean, I, I like the overall look of the competition that they have right now at that outside linebacker spot opposite Judon. Um Health, like you said, is is kind of the linchpin, it's kind of the turning point for the same thing. But that that's why these guys came in at sort of the discounted rates that they did. Yep. Is because of injury or maybe with McPhee, it's also a little bit of age, because I think he's 30, uh, 30 years old at this point. So, you know, you're 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 going to sort of see an offset in terms of what those guys can get on the market because of that. But like you said, if it works. If you feel confident in your scheme, which I think that they do, um, particularly with what they were able to do last year, number one defense and, and seeing all the thing, things that Wink could do. If you feel like, look, players are important. It's always about players. I'm not taking anything away from them. But I feel like I have a scheme that if you just get me some versatile pieces with some diverse skill sets, I can make it work. Right. I don't, exactly. need, I, I don't necessarily need a unicorn. I'd love a unicorn. Who wouldn't? But <laughs> uh, maybe we can't afford one of those. And so give me some versatile guys and I'll find a way to make it work. Uh, hopefully, you know, for the fans out there, this was a good, I think, of, and just another lesson of why you have to watch the tape. You have to kind of look at, look at all these other factors. Like, and I think the Ravens, um, in these two examples, uh, saw something on the tape they liked. And then in this case, they're, they're going to tra- take that money ball approach and let's see how it plays out this season. Yep, I'm looking forward to it. It ought to be really exciting. This is going to be uh, an interesting battle for this position group. Uh, they got some other interesting battles going on at other position groups, and uh, 
uh, as we're recording this uh, on what is this? This is Thursday, May the thirtieth. Uh, let's hope they can get Gerald McCoy, right? That That's still out there. That's a good uh, point. I've tried not to attach myself to that idea because I don't want to be heartbroken if it doesn't happen, but the thought of what they could have with their defensive line and pass rushers if they were able to sign him is it's pretty exciting. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, McCoy opens up so many other things, uh, and, and then we, we, we will probably allocate another time to talk about <laughs> He needs his own show. They get him. He needs his own own, show. He needs his own dedicated because he is a unicorn. But you don't want to box him in. You know, I know these these coaches get they understand that more than we do uh, fully. Yep, I'm right there with you. This has been a blast. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for uh, taking some time out and and the work that you put in leading up to this. Uh, This was this was great, and I hope people enjoy it. You know, I hope people check it out and uh, um, you know give us some feedback. They can. Find us at RSR, Russell Street Report. You can find yep. me on Twitter at, uh, at Abu Kari. That's A-B-U-K-A-R-I. Um, and, yeah, love love to hear any feedback on it that people have. Yeah, to echo that, I know, Mike, you're also, uh, you know, going to – Mike, you're also on the Film Study Podcast, so look out for your, your breakdowns with, with Ken, as we pointed out. Ken is uh, our one of our friends and colleagues. You guys do a great job. And then both of us are on Twitter. We're very active. You can find us on Twitter. I know with Mike, he also will take some of these uh, tape clip breakdowns, transfer them over to Twitter, start a conversation, and educate some folks. So uh, we love to talk shop. Uh, I think one of the fun parts of our job is also talking with other uh, you know, Ravens fans, Ravens observers, analysts, and trying to figure out kind of the chess game which is where did these guys fit? And this is the perfect time for that in the off season. We'll, we'll know what happens during the season, but we would love to hear your guys' feedback. So we appreciate you listening in to this. And uh, we, we look forward to talking to you some more on Twitter or Russell Street or wherever.